Your fear of insects may indeed be genetic and can even apply to experts. Just ask an entomologist. That's exactly what I did. Today, we are honored to speak with Dr. V. Subalakshmi, also known as India's Moth Lady. Dr. Subalakshmi is celebrated as one of the first women in India to study moths, breaking new ground in the realm of conservation and biodiversity research. Her remarkable career includes her time working with the prestigious Bombay Natural History Society, where she contributed significantly to environmental education and wildlife preservation. She is also the visionary founder of iNature Watch Foundation, an organization dedicated to fostering environmental awareness and citizen science. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Thank you so much, Arin, to having me. So uh, how exactly did your association with BNHS begin? And could you explain like for the viewers what BNHS does? Okay, BNHS is uh, Asia's oldest wildlife organization. You know, I think it's a mother of all the environmental organizations which are today thriving in India. Even all the people who are working today in India, they are connected to some or other way to BNHS. Uh, so when I was uh, doing my graduation, that's when I learned about BNHS and I became a member. And then I realized that this is the place I want to work. And, you know, I passed out somewhere in 1990. When I did my BSc in zoology, we keep, could keep hearing this, that there is no scope for zoology students. It's only physics, chemistry and maths. People can get jobs and even at least microbiology had a scope, but nothing to do with botany and zoology. So when I when I came to know about BNHS and I started visiting the library, I realized that this is the place I want to uh, you know, work for. But there was no job opportunities that way. And then so I started volunteering. Uh, with BNHS because I wanted to be connected to the organization to some or other way and if an opportunity arises I should be there this is what my strategy uh, was yeah that I should be there if an opportunity arises and there was an opportunity um, but the opportunity was for a uh, BCom candidate uh, basically for office administration I felt that let me give a try Though I'm a BSc, but I do know how to operate because I was doing very odd jobs at that point of time. I was working as a cashier for a jewelry shop. I was attending I was attending phone calls. I was a receptionist. So I had done lots of odd jobs by then uh, when I came to BNHS somewhere in 1993. So I did have some experience of, you know, doing works. So I felt that I can manage whatever this job is. Uh, to thrive in BNHS, I don't think so. Degrees matter that much, as much the passion matters. So the panelists were also looking for the passion. I think they only they saw the passion and they they thought that okay, I can be groomed and I can be and believe me for three and a half years I did all office accounts admin work and and at but there was this one flame alive inside me that someday I will get into the technical role at BNHS and that's the time I started by doing my master's BNHS uh, offers MSc by research uh, that's a very unique part of BNHS that it offers and it is associated to the university uh, Mumbai University. So I wanted to do my further studies. So I said, okay, there's a good opportunity that I can do my research as well and I can work as well. And the topic which I chose was moths. So I used to work during the weekends to start do my research work and during the week I used to work. So this is how it all started. And then 22 years passed by <laughs> because then I moved on to various positions after I completed this three and a half year stint as an administrative assistant. So there was another position for education officer coming up. And then I applied at the Conservation Education Center, which I was managing for BNHS um, in Goregaon in Mumbai. That is, that is where I started growing then from education officer. I rose to the position for a deputy director that's when I left the organization so yes it was my I would say um, my entire learning my entire uh, grooming as a professional and for whatever I'm doing today uh, the strong foundation was then laid during this time which I spent with BNHS so it is a fabulous and fantastic and today I'm on the governing council board of BNHS and it's like life has come full circle for me 
there seems to be like a genetic uh, fear which uh, many people have of insects and especially with the lepidopter infection it's received mixed reviews from the public one hand there are butterflies which are universally liked and then moths other people tend to find them a bit uh, overlooked as a result i'm sure during your life many people must have asked you why your study is not concentrated towards butterflies so what could maybe waver their interest towards moths yeah this was like you know just like any ordinary person even i was attracted to butterflies and somehow girls like it's a very feminine also you know like butterflies and women so it just goes very well so i was also very very much wanted to do my this masters which i was trying to do i wanted to do in butterflies uh, because the first person i met in villages was isaac kemka Oh yeah the butterfly man of india so obviously you're for bound to fall in love with butterfly so that's how it started for me also but thankfully my uh, guide who was heading the uh, collection department uh, he's no more now uh, mr uh, naresh chaturvedi he told me shubha there are many people who are studying butter- butterflies there's nothing new you are going to do why don't you study moths and probably that's the first time i heard about moths when he told me about it i really didn't know who, what moths are i'm lucky i belong to a generation you know like you would have seen this on insta you know that we are the generation who never questioned their parents who never challenged their ed- elders and who who listened to their children <laughs> we are the only generation who, which is do, which will which is doing that so because my guy told me to uh, pursue moths i didn't question him even though i had no clue about what it is you do that today people will ask you 100 question why you're making me to study moths when i want to study butterflies justify why you want to you know, do that i i hope you re- you can resonate with that yeah. <laughs> that aspect because... i understand so but yes but so we were we were we were the probably right last generation who considered teachers as gurus but i think what really attracted me when my guy told me about it he said shubha nobody is studying moths especially ecology of moth uh, at that point of time and even today there are many taxonomists who are studying moths taxonomists who do more of lab work of course they do the field collection but they do more of the lab work but i was not the lab person i wanted to do more of a field work and you will be the first person to do so when he said that you know the, the topic got sold out for me because i, I really i i i love to um, uh, travel the path where there is no path you know like so i want to i love those kind of challenges and this somehow fitted that yes i said this is what i want to do which nobody has done it let me do it so that's how it all started because i believed uh, in him and uh, you are right that there is a um, there was an insect phobia there was an insect phobia because the current times are so different in my time children were having the insect phobia in fact i was an insect phobic person many people would not know that because my mother was insect phobic and i therefore i keep telling that maybe you have heard this in my lectures or on the walks i say the insect phobia is a genetic problem because it isn't passed on from the parents to the children and children to their children you know that, that's how my mother did that so she was insect phobic so she made me insect phobic but thanks to bnhs so when i joined bnhs once i started going on the uh, trail started exploring the wild that's where uh, i started that phobia was going away and thanks to isaac came he was one like you know like he to this kind of words so i actually exclaimed this way when i saw a caterpillar and then he told me that if you want to make a career in this field you have to forget this word okay and yeah that's how i got over my phobia and then i made a commitment or rather i decided this that i will try to bust people's insect phobia from insect phobic person to an insect lover person so that's where i my entire um, educational aspect you know they're doing the educational programs uh, i glamorized insects deliberately for that matter it was just like you know marketing insects to a mass which is not liking insect but the current scenario is very different today today children are so much into insects and so much so that i have i have 
change uh, my thinking about the current generation especially the young children and thanks to their parents i would say who are uh, making children more exploratory so they're not limiting children don't touch this don't do this you know so i think that is a, and today so much of no, so much of information is available and insects being the nearest accessible animal small animal accessible to, to a them. child yes so it is so you know that that has inspired me to write a encyclopedia for children i'm writing in insect encyclopedia for children for because there is this change of scenario like Uh, today people are buying my math book for the first standard grade but i could see that they they using my book i was very surprised so things have changed for good i would say and is there any specific animal which tends to creep you out leeches <laughs> i'm scared of leeches yeah those are the ones i just can't like i feel scared <laughs> and yeah. what specifically would be your favorite insect my my favorite insect is atlas moth <laughs> yeah when uh, the first email id user id that i created was atlas moth my user id was atlas moth atlas moth is like a tiger for me you know you the number of time you see a tiger you never get bored i read somewhere that those wings are meant to look like uh, snake heads yeah that yeah that's a, that's a, that's just an interpretation yes but the whole idea of its entire body the color combination with the transparent way transparent windows in it is to break the body form is to break the body form wherever it is so that you can't really make out that there is a, so obviously this eye like markings are there to just to divert the attention so yeah that's 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 true like i would say it is a handful of a moth i always say if you take a atlas moth you have to take your both palms to place the atlas moth so it's like a handful of moth Uh, so uh, you're often associated with uh, Dr. Kahimkar. You've credited him a lot, especially yeah. like, uh, of course, during the foundation of I Nature Watch. Could you describe Dr. Kahimkar in three words? Oh, I call him as a living encyclopedia of natural history. <laughs> I mean, he has been my first guru. I would say, uh, learned so much of natural history from him, and so much of work ethics as far as wildlife studies are concerned. So he has been uh, a great supporter for me. My growing years, you may be very passionate, you are dedicated, you are hardworking, but unless you meet the right people who can charter you on the right path, you need such people. So that's why I always tell people that try to have a mentor always, and never forget them. even if you do well in life because how they helped you in your formative years don't forget them because of them you are what today so you never so i'm i'm always grateful to my mentors my gurus and all the people who helped me in building my career that's that's really great to hear another question i wanted to ask was um, are you for or against having insects and other invertebrates as pets in captivity very difficult question i would say one thing which i have seen is that it's very uh, educational having insect pets and it is very easy like in abroad they bring animals to the classroom to yeah. to make end like i i i remember i was in a session where they brought a falcon in the classroom and the falcon was going here and there and so that excitement and that awe and that uh, feeling which is like which breaks some uh, boredom or the routine and something different i think that it brings that component to learning and it is very effective for children i would say pets teach so many life le- lessons to children uh, of mm, yeah. interacting with another life i don't think the same kind of thing is applicable when it comes to invertebrates Yeah, invertebrates are more of yeah. observation animals. Yes, I yes, mean, just like you have a fish tank, like yeah, having a yeah, fish tank. You know, and you know, you have to change time. You can't have your own views just going on for years and years. As the time changes, one has to change. And through this, like through maybe nature programs, etc., have have you seen increasing interest and awareness among the public regarding invertebrates, regarding nature conservation? Yeah. that's so that's so that's what i told you earlier that it has yeah. changed drastically and uh, my earlier years i have been doing this uh, lots of insect programs and even i am doing right now also uh, insect programs especially moths so today moths are 
equally considered or rather in the same breath people talk about butterflies and moths together that is so good now when they go when when they are going out for doing a butterfly study or a butterfly photography they are doing during the daytime they are photographing butterflies and in the night time they are photographing moths so mothing is something i would really take that credit up huh? i am the one who started popularizing it to the people when taking my lights and my curtain in every camp and putting it up and making people observe the moths over there that's something i would take a credit because nobody had done that before and may basically introducing general masses to this process of mothing that's something you know i, I think i started this process somewhere in 2005 or something since then i started so uh, my whole idea was to make people fall in love with uh, with with moths because everyone has this myth that moths are dull and drab i said hello you can't just judge a moth by sitting in your bedroom yeah. you have to go into the bedroom of a moth go into the forest go into the wild in the night time and see which moths you can see so i always say that um, why butterflies clicked or why butterflies became popular because butterflies lifestyle and our lifestyle is almost same they are also they also they also rise after sunrise they wind up by the evening they are available during the day time they are colorful they are beautiful they are accessible so everything so as in our wake hours butterflies are what we see it's only when the dark comes and then the moths come and we are not interested also in them and we don't want to you know sacrifice our sleep so you don't get to know about moths i'm sure you know of human induced evolution of peppered moths during the industrial yeah, revolution yeah yeah uh, yeah so to what extent has human activity affected insect populations who is going to do this study <laughs> to give this answer there is you know that, that's very sad part at least in our yeah. country in india entomological studies haven't gone beyond agriculture studies and today whatever studies of insects are happening is all taxonomy we can actually study climate change in correlation with insects if you want early indicators of climate change you study smaller animals who get first impacted because their microclimate gets changed before it reaches to a bird or a mammal we are already late so there is no we are not sorry to say we are not doing any of those kind of studies in our country Yeah. Like many people ask this question, journalists, you know, they are so fond of this all this facts and figures. Oh, give me uh, the most endangered moth. I say, who knows which is the endangered moth because nobody has done assessment of the population. Then no, I have seen records on uh, insects which are endangered, threatened, and all that. Nobody. Insects are going to become our top competitors. I would say they want the food we eat, they want the clothes we wear, they want the books we read, they want to live the place where we are living. They want everything so much so they are after our blood also. So they are closest competitor which we are not noticing. A man may think great about himself, but ask a fly, it would say it is something I just have every night. All we have to do is that learn to coexist with them. and understand them if you understand them very well and then you can actually coexist with them that's it we can't get rid of insects or like you can't get rid of cockroaches from your life but you can coexist by managing it so how it is going to impact uh, in in general i would say of course the amount of uh, chemicals that we are using so not only the good not only the bad insects that anybody anybody is targeting but also the good insects are getting uh, affected by it so many people tell me that you know i have beautiful garden i have lots of flowering plants i have lots of greenery but i still don't get butterflies i don't get uh, insects which come i said exactly you have you have created a very well curated garden you might have used lots of pesticide or Uh, any other chemical like um, we create butterfly parks uh, for many corporates and then they do this fogging for mosquitoes every evening so i have to tell them that you can't do fogging in this area because fogging is for mosquito i understand but butterfly is also an insect and mosquito is also yeah. an insect the same chemical will affect them you know like how ignorant people are even the hit company knows that Therefore, it is selling four, three different color, uh, one for cockroach, one for termite, one for ants. The fact is that any one will use yeah, for all, all three. Yeah, all of all three. But you are taking the benefits, and then you can't deal with the losses. So, if there is ninety percent benefit and ten percent loss, it's still very good, good business deal. Ask any businessman; it is a good business deal. You can't cry about the ten percent losses. 
because you're getting 90% benefit the final question uh, i wanted to ask was what would the common person uh, manage to do in terms of uh, preservation or helping with um, conservation of wildlife i think common man can certainly uh, start having gardens you know gardens that are helpful for butterflies for bees for birds because everybody is fond of garden uh so why not have plants that attract birds butterflies bees even bats i would say uh so that you are creating small mini sanctuaries for them i call them as stopovers so in a city if there are say such small small stopovers for a for an animal so like it it helps them to navigate from one look one wild area to another wild area where there is a city in between that's number one because it goes very well with our need also because we are fond of gardens second way of doing it that can we uh, reduce our um, carbon footprint as much possible eco friendly lifestyles wherever possible so within whatever standards you are whatever standards you are having let it be a part of your lifestyle it's not be something that you do addition like you know coming for waste recycling do you recycle your waste because there's a basic thing what one can do so just recycling your waste composting your waste and bringing less waste inside the home also like let us cut out the so at uh, the source only so pick up products where there is less packaging is the small culture of every vegetable being packed in the plastic don't don't buy it from all them go and buy vegetable from a roadside vendor or who is selling it as it is so there is no plastic involved motto should be that you are recycling every waste of yours nothing is going into the landfill that's that motto is difficult to follow but it is doable so that's that's number one second is that whatever resources we are using whether it's like whether it is electricity whether it's water any resource any resource overview use we do we are using somebody else share it's always like that so can we just use what is needed not overuse or don't or rather I don't see. misuse uh, also uh, if you want to help nature you become a stingy person you try to save everything you cut down everything you know so uh, you have to get that mentality of trying to save that paper try to reuse that bag try not to throw away this do recycle something you know so to have the mentality of a stingy person you may do good for the environment this is what i can say and let it be your lifestyle or a family tradition we talk about family tradition which teach children about our family cultures and values saving environment and working with or or protecting animals especially you know like uh, stray animals for example stray animals are also part of our our environment okay so what how we actually treat them how we um, uh, uh, interact with them is also uh, uh, something that we can teach our children children need to be taught about it because the number of animal cruelty cases which are going going on rise is is really mind boggling rather you know and very disturbing also so can we bring in all these small small things and make it a family charter a family charter that we will our family members will follow this 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 Uh, rules and let it happen in the family itself school can be a place of learning and everything but family is the place where everything becomes permanent so there is this this two concepts one is a carbon footprint and one is called handprint carbon footprint is whatever carbon you are taking whatever resources you are taking from the environment for living a life handprint is that whatever efforts you are doing in giving back that carbon back like reducing that so for example okay i'm using plastic bags but i'm reusing it so reusing becomes my handprint i'm reducing the uh, number of plastic bags come to my home so having a balance of carbon footprint and the handprint is something everybody should try for so i see okay you are fond of sh- where you're fond of showers like you want to take a shower fine so you you are using more water but can you do the rain water harvesting also can you protect the water can you save the water can you help the water percolation in the ground so this is my handprint so can we balance up can we offset our own carbon it will really have that 
butterfly effect what you're talking about or ripple effect because that's yeah. needed the problem today is that but uh, i don't know how many people i think but uh, yeah solely people have become aware but they're not that aware still not we have to go long way so this is something i would like to say mm. carbon like footprint and handprint that was a beautiful response i always wanted to know an entomologist perspective regarding conservation and bolstering curiosity among this generation regarding a faction that has been so overlooked i hope there were some questions which you haven't heard before yeah the pet one and the leech one My best wishes to you as well. Thanks a lot for your time. It was a wonderful time having you on the channel. I'm hoping to expand my contacts and for that I need you guys to subscribe. This is ABSE signing out. Take care and goodbye.